Hello and welcome to A Tactical History of Liverpool. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the very first match of the day, Liverpool-Arsenal from August 1964. The new programme was screened on BBC Two, which had only started that April and couldn't even be viewed on Merseyside, meaning no one at the game would have been able to see it. It was estimated that this first episode drew just 20,000 viewers, less than half the number of people attending the match. This wasn't the first time the BBC had sent its crew to Anfield to see Liverpool play Arsenal though. Four months prior in April, the cameras had been present as Liverpool sealed the league championship by thrashing Arsenal 5-0. They weren't too interested in the game itself though. Instead, they were sent to record Liverpool supporters in the cop, whose chance had captured the public's imagination enough to merit a special by Panorama. Liverpool supporters had been singing on the terraces since the early 50s and had already developed an anarchic streak. Arthur Kagan was well known in this era for conducting community singing before FA Cup finals at Wembley and he took his show on the road, touring the country with his brass band. Things didn't exactly go to plan when he reached Liverpool though. As Kagan and his band attempted to leave the singing, the cop would pipe up with a different tune and when Kagan changed to whatever song the cop had been singing, they would start up again with yet another tune. Eventually Kagan was forced into giving up, defeated. With the emergence of a new youth culture in the 60s, singing at football became popularised though, with supporters adapting the lyrics to fit their teams and players. It wasn't really a surprise that Liverpool supporters were at the forefront of this change, as the city was leading this cultural wave. Liverpool grew and grew in the 19th century as its port was the major link between Britain and the United States. By the 1950s, this trade had waned, although Liverpool was still feeling its benefits, with sailors bringing home American rock and roll records and granting easier access to musical instruments. The city was home to hundreds of bands, so while Bill Shankly's men were clambering out of the second division and taking over the Football League, the city's music was taking over the country's charts. Asked some of the population of, of England where they would like to have lived in the 60s. Definitely Liverpool. The Beatles had been playing to a packed cabin club since the start of the decade, but national success eluded them until 1963. Once the world found out about them, though, there was no putting the genie back in the bottle. In October, a news report started appearing in the American press about the emerging phenomenon across the Atlantic, but by the time the group appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964, they had already had several number one singles in the US. Nielsen ratings estimated that 45% of US television viewers that night saw their appearance. Beatlemania had gone international. It wasn't just the Beatles though. Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Searchers, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas and Scylla Black all had UK number ones. Comedians Ken Dodd and Jimmy Tarbuck were household names. Even Prime Minister Harold Wilson, elected in 1964, was educated across the Mersey at Will Grammar School and was the MP for Highton. Liverpool Football Club took part in the British Invasion. After winning the league in 1964, the club set off on a post-season tour of the United States, playing local and foreign sides. They would even appear on the Ed Sullivan Show themselves, alongside Jerry and the Pacemakers. It's nice to have in our audience one of the great soccer teams of England, the Liverpool team that won the English League title. Would you stand up, gentlemen? All of you. Come on. Everybody up. Well, come on now, America, let's hear it. Come on, Liverpool. <laughs> Shankly didn't take to America though. He was aghast that there existed people in the world who had never heard of Tom Finney and refused to turn his watch back, stating, no Yanks going to tell me what time it is. There was one saving grace though. Liverpool played at Soldier Field in Chicago, the site of a world title fight between Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney. Upon learning this, Shankly demanded to know where the ring had stood and insisted his players train there. Liverpool tour in the US was a regular occurrence. In 1945, Liverpool chairman Billy McConnell had visited the US on a Ministry of Food mission to study catering, and a year later, George Kay took his men to America. Whereas in Britain, post-war rationing wouldn't end until 1954. In the United States, except for sugar, it ended with the war. Touring the US gave Liverpool a rare opportunity to provide their athletes with real nourishment, and they took full advantage. Liverpool's players each put on an average of half a stone in weight over the course of the trip. Kay would highlight the good food our boys had in America as a key reason for their league win in the following campaign. These tours would continue, including a six-week marathon in 1953, when manager Don Welsh caught a home run ball from New York Yankee Mickey Mantle during a game. Liverpool would be relegated the next season. By 1964, this tradition had overstayed its welcome, however. 
Having already had a long season winning the league, Liverpool now had an extra 10 games tacked onto the end of it in a sweltering American summer. These were meant to just be friendlies, but Shankly took a defeat to Hamburg badly, and Liverpool, as reigning English champions, had to restore their pride. Rather than coming back from their summer break well-rested, Liverpool were exhausted, while Ron Yeats returned home from the United States with his leg in plaster. Shankly blamed the tour, and so there would be no more postseason folly. By 1967, playing in Europe had convinced Shankly there was more value to be found playing against European sides, and doing so before the season rather than after it, allowing the Reds to get back to match sharpness in preparation for the season proper, a method that continues to this day. It wasn't just the US tour that had left Liverpool ill-prepared for the 64-65 season, though. As the players reported back for pre-season training, Ian St. John had to be rushed to hospital for an emergency appendix operation and wouldn't be available until mid-September. Things went from bad to worse for Liverpool when young forward Alf Arrowsmith badly injured his knee just 10 minutes into the charity shield clash with West Ham, ruling himself out until after Christmas. The league hadn't even started yet and Liverpool were already knackered and without two of their front line. It was in these circumstances that Liverpool began their defence of their league crown as Arsenal came to town. Shankly made just two changes to the 11 that had thrashed Arsenal in April, as St John and Arrowsmith were replaced by Gordon Wallace and Phil Chisnell in Liverpool's 3-2-5 shape. This left Liverpool with a young front line, as 26-year-old Roger Hunt was the only man older than 22. Opposition manager Billy Wright made three changes, as new signing Don Howe came into the team. Peter Simpson was promoted from the youth side, and Terry Anderson was given an opportunity on the left wing, replacing Jimmy McGill, Terry Neal, and Alan Skirton in their 3 2 5. Now, for the very first thing that looks foreign to modern eyes are the back lines. Today we have back threes, but they are really back fives with three central defenders. Back in the early 60s, they played a true back three, though, with one sole centre back. This would be considered suicidal today, especially when taking into consideration the number of attacking players they were going up against. So how did they cope? Now, there were various different factors at play here. Firstly, fullbacks in the early 60s were very much defenders first. So while they may push forward, they were unlikely to be leaving their centre-back exposed as the more committed attacking fullbacks of today do. A second way of dealing with the issue was for the centre-back to be more aggressive. Rather than sitting off and allowing an attacker time to use the space to either side of them, they would lunge into a tackle or block early on, cutting out the problem before it could emerge. The main way teams would protect the centre-back was by using the half-backs, though. In this match, Gordon Milne would frequently drop in next to Ron Yeats for Liverpool, as would Willie Stevenson, albeit not as often. The obvious issue with this strategy was that it would remove Milne from the midfield, but Liverpool's collective play helped cover for this. Rather than staying forward like a typical outside right, Ian Callaghan would track back and tuck inside to fill in for Milne in midfield. There was also Phil Chisnell who despite being an inside forward on paper was happy to drop back deep into his own half to fill in defensively. This meant Milne or Stevenson could drop deep to help out Yeats without having to worry about the space they were leaving to do so, as Callaghan and Chisnell would cover for them. This was the major difference between Liverpool and Arsenal. Billy Wright also had his half-backs drop deep to help out their defenders and pick defensive choices to do so, as both Peter Simpson and John Snedden would spend most of their careers at centre-half. Unlike Liverpool, this opened up massive spaces in midfield, Primarily defensive players, Simpson and Snedden would often position themselves deep even when Liverpool didn't pose an attacking threat, where their forwards wouldn't drop back to cover for them in midfield. George Armstrong showed himself willing to track back out wide, as did George Easton, but these were the odd moment rather than a consistent pattern. Usually Simpson and Snedden would get dragged back into defence, then there would be a massive gap between them and the attack. Chisnell was the main beneficiary of this. Chisnell would drop back defensively, but he also liked to drop off into a more withdrawn role in possession, using the space in midfield Arsenal left for him. This helped to get Stevenson involved, combining with Chisnell in possession to play around Arsenal and move the ball forward. It wasn't just Chisnell though. Wallace was also finding little pockets of space, while Roger Hunt was happy to drop off into midfield or pull wide to collect the ball. This ensured Liverpool had the better opening to the game. Arsenal weren't exactly helping themselves by pumping the ball forward every time they got it, handing possession straight back to Liverpool. Even when they showed a willingness to play the ball along the ground, they were trying to get it to the forwards too quickly, immediately releasing the ball rather than taking a second and actually picking out a quality pass. This was in stark contrast to Liverpool, who worked the ball forward with neat passing moves. Burn, Callaghan back to Burn. Liverpool moving the ball so accurately, so well, drawing Arsenal out of position, playing lovely football. It wasn't exactly a shock when Liverpool took the lead, but its origins didn't really follow the overall pattern of play that had emerged. 
Peter Thompson had been largely anonymous in the opening stages of the game, only really managing to draw a foul from Howe and having to come inside into the centre to get involved. With 10 minutes gone, he picked up the ball on the left and dribbled forward, avoiding Armstrong's challenge to go down the outside, before cutting back and crossing to Callahan on the opposite flank. Callahan took a touch and crossed back into the box, where Hunt appealed back towards the penalty spot to volley home. 1-0 Liverpool. Having helped give Liverpool the lead, Thompson came alive. Naturally right-footed, Thompson would shape to come inside before twisting his hips and going down the outside, then cutting back onto his right, beating his man over and over again. Thompson would play a key part in the second goal just after half-time. It was remarkably similar to the first, with Thompson appearing to overhit a cross from a corner out to Callahan on the opposite flank. Four Arsenal players ran towards Callahan, leaving just one inside with two Liverpool attackers, so Callahan chipped it back towards the far post for Wallace to head home. It was perhaps noteworthy that while Thompson played a key role in the goals, the direct assists came from Callahan. Thompson tormented his defenders, leaving them unable to work out what he was going to do next, but his teammates had the same problem. Thompson would beat his man so many times, Liverpool's attackers didn't know when the cross was coming, and so couldn't effectively time their runs to meet it. Thompson's amazing dribbling was a running joke in the dressing room. I remember one day we came in and Billy Stevenson, who, who was a bit of a joker, we were all sitting down with a half-time cup of tea and Billy says, Peter, he said, what a dribble that was you had there. He says, you beat six people, he says, the referee three times and me twice. <laughs> I was an individualist, admitted Thompson. I tried not to be like that, but I couldn't change. Theoretically, this should have ruled him out of Shankly's more collective vision. But Shankly's love of Tom Finney ensured he had a soft spot for tricky wingers, making room for Billy Hogan at Carlisle and Jimmy Hernan at Grimsby. Callan was less flashy than Thompson, generally bursting to the line to cross, but this was also easier for his teammates to read. Arsenal staged a comeback though. By the end of the first half, Jeff Strong had started to drop back into midfield, as did Easton. This meant Arsenal could actually work the ball forward, along the ground, through the centre, rather than simply hoofing it forward and handing possession back to Liverpool. This approach suited Liverpool-born forward Joe Baker much better, as he was the type of striker to prefer passes into feet rather than chasing after balls in behind or battling in the air. Playing to Baker's strengths had a knock-on effect of getting Anderson more involved, as the striker would drift away from his nominal position, occupying Yeats, to create space through the centre for Anderson to come inside and attack. Arsenal clawing back control highlighted the weaknesses of Liverpool's back three system. At one point, Yeats appeared to be marking Anderson, only to back away to pick up Baker, leaving Anderson completely free to make a run and cut the ball back in the box. At another, Yeats was pulled away from the centre by Baker, as Strong made a run into the box to meet a cross, calling Tommy Lawrence into action. This showed that Milne dropping back into defence wasn't an ideal solution. Even if he spotted the run and dropped back to plug the gap left by Yeats, at five foot seven, he wasn't really the kind of player you wanted to rely on to head away crosses. The most glaring example was Arsenal's first goal, though. They played the ball to Anderson down the left, and as he cut inside, Milne dropped into defence to plug the gap between Jerry Byrne and Yeats, leaving Strong in space to receive the ball on the edge of the area. Strong dribbled at the back line, drawing out Yeats, and played a 1-2 with Easton, darting into the space Yeats had left and finishing past Lawrence. Milne had to drop back into defence to help Yeats, meaning he wasn't in a position to stop Strong in midfield. Arsenal's equaliser highlighted another weakness in the side, Ronnie Moran. Moran stepped up to get tighter to Baker and confront Strong pushing forward on the ball, but in doing so he deserted Armstrong. Strong simply spread the ball wide to Armstrong making a run in behind Moran, forcing Yeats across to cover. With Yeats pulled across, Baker had space in the centre, so Armstrong crossed and the striker finished. This wasn't the first time Moran had done this, allowing Armstrong to run in behind him, forcing Yeats into coming across to cover. Liverpool had also nearly conceded an equaliser in the first half when Moran missed the ball attempting to cut it out, letting it run through to Baker to shoot. He also posed a problem in possession. He was able to pick out lovely clean passes with his left foot, despite the clogging work boots footballers used to wear. However, at 30 years old, he was the senior man in the team and so wasn't the most agile. Give Moran time and space to get the ball out, and he could pick out a nice pass, but put him under pressure and his movements looked slow and stiff, meaning he wasn't ideal for Shankly's pass and move style. Byrne provides a neat contrast to Moran. The fullback wasn't the most technically gifted of players, but he had the agility to move a ball on quickly and move into space. Moran had complimented Shankly, saying he wished he was five years younger when he arrived at Anfield. He made a big, big impact not only on the club, he made a big impact on me. I only wish he would have been about five years younger when he arrived because 
I learned more off him in three months than I'd learned in all the years previously on, on knowledge of the game. Yeah, with that was the tacit admission that he was a bit long in the tooth to be making major changes to his game at this stage of his career. Thankfully, Moran's error didn't prove costly for Liverpool. Though. Minutes from time, Arsenal were on the attack, switching play out to Anderson on the left. Struggling to control the ball, he gave Burn the opportunity to make a tackle and poke the ball away though. As Burn pushed forward, Anderson ran with him and attempted a tackle, only to miss the ball completely, fouling Burn. Burn's strength allowed him to simply shrug off the challenge though, continuing forward as the referee played on despite the linesman flagging for a foul. Burn poked the ball inside to Chisnell, only for Callahan to nip in ahead of him, quickening the pace of Liverpool's play. Callahan spread the ball out to Wallace, who, with Arsenal's defenders backing off, had space to control the ball, drive inside and fire a shot past Jim Fernell. Liverpool 3, Arsenal 2. It wasn't quite the 5-0 thrashing they gave out in April, but Liverpool did at least get a win as they started their defence of their league crown. It wasn't to last, though. Liverpool followed up this victory by winning just three of their next 15 in the league, dropping to 21st place with a 4-0 thrashing in the Merseyside derby. Going into November, they sat in 19th. Moran was dropped at the end of October, with Byrne moving across to left-back and 21-year-old Chris Lawler replacing him on the right. Moran wouldn't be seen again until March. October would also see Alan Acourt leave the club. He'd stuck by Liverpool through the dark days in the second division, but injuries had taken their toll. He had missed the entirety of the previous season, and with Peter Thompson ahead of him in the pecking order, he had no chance of winning back his spot. He at least had the honour of appearing in Liverpool's first ever European night at Anfield, before making a short trip across the Mersey to join Tranmere Rovers. And what of Liverpool's new wonder kid, Gordon Wallace? The Scots' winner here was his fifth goal in a week, scoring one against West Ham in the Charity Shield and two in the European Cup first round. Despite starting his league campaign with a brace, the Arsenal game had also showcased a frustrating tendency to give the ball away cheaply though. Wallace would continue in the side until the derby loss in September, where three losses on the trot saw him replaced by Bobby Graham. He would make just four more appearances that season before dropping back into the reserves for a frustrating injury stricken two years before leaving for crew. Liverpool were out of the title race before Christmas and Shankly was blaming that bloody American tour. A black cat is running on the far side. There it is. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to support the channel. You can get updates on what I'm doing by following on Twitter and Facebook. Links are in the description. But most importantly, by supporting Holding Me Field on Patreon. Without financial support, I can't justify the time it goes into making these videos to keep the channel alive while also receiving access to premium content. Thanks for watching. Now, I know it's a cat. I wonder which side it supports, Arsenal or Liverpool. It's going over to have a word with Jim Fennell, I think, the Arsenal goalkeeper. Now, he's decided he's not going to be an Arsenal fan. Oh, I missed him.